as Acting Secretary for the Council for Mission in Ireland, I want to say thank you for your interest in our work and the support you give. Since March 2020, that work has continued, even if in different forms due to the restrictions that there have been. And of necessity, most of what you see in this overview was filmed before those restrictions were put in place. Irish mission worker David Boyd in Dublin runs online Bible studies with students instead of face-to-face -face in the International Café. Deaconesses and congregations continue to give pastoral support, but online or over the phone. Louise Davidson is one of three newly commissioned deaconesses. In Craigavon, Urban Mission Minister Lachlan Webster reports that people who've never been inside the church building before have been connected with the gospel through online services. University chaplains Cheryl Mabin and Dave Gray continue to minister to students in Ulster University, Queen's, Stranmillis and Union, including those resident in Derry Volgi Halls. Our forces chaplains, including Philip Wilson, bring the gospel into the lives of those serving in the Army, Air Force and Navy. Home mission ministers such as Mark Proctor are finding new ways to pastor their congregations and reach out with the gospel. Part of Mark's work is hospital chaplaincy. And of course our hospital chaplains are on the front line in the healthcare system, ministering to patients with and without COVID and to their families. There's more than I can mention in the space available, but I'm delighted to report that there are some exciting developments in prospect with the construction of a new church building for the Congregation of Maynooth, the extension of the work of the International Meeting Point in South Belfast to include North Belfast, and a church plant from Donabate into Balbriggan. Thank you so much for your continuing prayer and financial support through the United Appeals since last March. May you know God's blessing in the life of your own presbytery and congregation.
I was employed as a community outreach worker for Donabate Presbyterian back in 2016. Part of my role at the time was to investigate the possibility of us uh, planting a church somewhere in the surrounding area between Donabate and Drogheda. I travelled around those towns and it became pretty clear from an early stage that Balbriggan was the place that God was leading us to because there was a few families who were living in Balbriggan at the time but travelling to church in Donabate and some families were actually travelling to Drogheda as well. I started to meet with them, I went around to their houses and they just really opened their homes to us. They showed so much kindness to us. Then that summer, we ran a kids club for the first time in the town and those were the kind of core families who, who got behind this. I got to got involved with the, the Presbyterian Church through a uh, summer kids camp in 2019 last year. Got to know Josh over a period of 2018 to 2019. During that time, I did Bible study in a neighbor's house and seeing Josh more regularly and got to build, build my faith you know, in Jesus and God and, and having the Holy Spirit more in my life. Balbriggan is a really exciting place uh, to be living at the minute. It's Ireland's youngest town and also Ireland's most ethnically diverse town. You can even see that as you're driving through. You can see the Irish pubs are surrounded by uh, African food shops, Polish delis, Turkish barbers. The taste of the world is you feel as soon as you drive through Balbriggan. I was born in Nairobi, in Kenya, and I was born into a Christian family. So I grew up in a Christian home, went to church every Sunday, and like there was no excuse to miss church at all. I came to Ireland in 2005. I moved from uh, Santry to Balbriggan in 2012. We continued going to Donabit Presbyterian Church. It had become our home because um, my sister and myself and our families. We're really excited to be in this town because uh, we're trying to create a place where people can just walk in from any faith or no faith and uh, experience Jesus and, and meet Jesus for themselves and read the Bible. We've been running kids camps in the town for three years now and um, we ran our first one just as a pilot to see if there was any interest and then since then we've been starting to meet uh, for Bible studies in people's homes and we meet right in various locations around Balbriggan. Having the Presbyterian Church in Balbriggan is what completed my faith as missing Bible studies and praying you know in small groups and that's something that uh, happens within this church. We ran an alpha course uh, last year, um, just uh, in a room above a local pub. And uh, yeah, that was really exciting for, to see people um, just come together a little bit more, community to grow. And then since then, uh, since our last kids camp in the summer, we've been uh, having some monthly services and we've just started to meet uh, weekly, just at the end of January. So when I first came to Ireland and I didn't have a church to go to, and for years and years and years, I kind of drifted away from my faith because I had no fellowship, you know, I had nowhere to go. And then I found Donabit Presbyterian Church and um, it's, it's been such a blessing because it's brought me back home to Christ here. Our vision for this church is that it's a place which is open to everybody. It's not, it's not just open to Irish people, it's open to people from all nationalities, all ages, uh, all backgrounds. And we just hope that we can create a place where people feel at home and where, where people can experience God's presence through uh, His Word and through worship. Last January, we started weekly church services in Balbriggan and over the, the, the number of weeks that we were meeting physically, we were just really sensing that we were growing in our love for God and our love for each other and it was a beautiful time. The, the, the church family was becoming really close and there was lots of people connecting with us from the town as well. Then the unthinkable happened and a global pandemic struck. We, we had to stop meeting physically and um, so instead we moved on to Zoom and We've actually been meeting for most of the weeks over the last year on Zoom and we were able to get back a little bit over the summer and before Christmas. And if you told me that this was going to happen, I would have thought it was going to be a disaster for the new church. But actually, we've we found that God has blessed us in other ways. And we've, we've grown closer to each other by calling each other up during the week. We've been able to continue reading the Bible together on Zoom for Bible studies and we've been able to meet on Zoom for Sunday services. Um, so while lots has been lost in terms of uh, physical community, uh, we're still very closely connected to each other. We are really longing to be able to meet together physically as a church again. Over the last year, we've seen God bless us in unexpected ways despite the limitations of uh, what we're allowed to do. 
we've um, we've seen people grow in their faith dramatically and in their love for each other. And we've also um, been able to welcome some new families into the church. However, we, we really pray that over the coming weeks and months, that this sense of community that we had, particularly at the start and that has continued over lockdown, that it wouldn't be dampened and that God would sustain us. We continue to trust that God is with us here in Bob Regan and that he is building his church here. My name's Keith. I work at the International Meeting Point. And on behalf of the staff and the volunteers here, I just want to thank all of you so much for all of your many contributions. It means so much to us uh, to be able to help so many people, and it's only possible through your help. I'll just let the other staff and volunteer members run through and let you know you're making a difference. Hi, I'm Henry, and uh, when people come into the centre, I'm basically the first person they meet, so we're here to welcome them. You know, COVID has brought big changes to our ministries, but it has also brought amazing new opportunities. Last week, we had over 180 people coming into the centre from 21 different countries. Countries where the gospel has been closed for so long. And so they come in, they're welcomed, they're reminded of the social distancing rules, and then and we get them to start uh, sanitize their hands and we take their temperature. Now people come in, yes they need practical help, but they also just want to have a friendly face that they know, and we're here to touch them with the love of Jesus. Hi, my name is Sylvia, and throughout this pandemic we have been distributing food to people who are coming from all corners of Belfast, but mainly from South Belfast and North Belfast. They come in, they take a bag, and they a bag each. So they come in for the essentials such as rice, sugar, tuna, oil, pasta sauce, pastas, coffee, toiletries. So these are the main essentials that people coming in looking for. And we are so blessed to be able to just help people in this way throughout this very difficult time. I am Susan. I uh, do the toiletries. Um, we are very grateful for people coming in from the other countries. They have nothing at all, so toiletries is always very important. And thank you for everybody who donates in. Thank you. I'm Sharon and we're right over here we're doing the bed lift a minute for all the folks we find that this has been such a help you come into the country and this is great just to be able to get practical help and support they're always asking for duvets and sheets double and single and um, it's a great way for actually of helping people here at the meet point. Hi I'm Frances and um, I'm normally in the shop um, international meeting point up shop uh, in Clifton Street Belfast it's a charity shop for baby and children's clothes. Uh, we have a great ministry there, also of prayer and um, counselling and um, and pastoral care, um, just to, to love everyone that walks in through that door. Um, so unfortunately, we're non-essential. So I'm here at International Meeting Point in South Belfast um, and uh, thoroughly enjoying up here as well. I just brought you upstairs uh, uh, to see all the clothes that we have for men and for women. This side is all for the men, the coats and the jumpers, um, trousers, jeans, um, hoodies, you name it. And the other side is all the uh, women's clothes. Um, we don't have many women in at the moment uh, because of COVID um, and our English classes are off at the moment, but uh, we have lots of men really need these winter clothes, the big heavy coats and we'll do shoes, we'll do trainers, down to the very socks. So we are here to help everyone. Thank you. Thank you again for all your support for everything that you've supplied to us. At the minute we seem to have enough to be able to keep us going for a few weeks. Uh, please keep an eye on the Facebook page and I can be in touch through the Presbytery again if we need another call out. Thank you.
One thing we've learned over lockdown is that while the church buildings may have been closed, church certainly has not. If anything, God's people have learned new patterns of ministry, prayer and outreach. And so, although it's not possible for us to have our traditional Council of Mission in Ireland rallies this year, it is my pleasure as convener of the Council, nonetheless, to bring you a message from God's Word to encourage, inspire and hopefully lift our spirits. Our Bible readings today are from 2 Kings chapters 6 and 7, and they may at first glance seem obscure and unfamiliar, but please stick with us. Many of us know well the wonderful story of Naaman, cured of his leprosy, found in 2 Kings chapter 5. But less well known are the chapters that follow on, written down to remind Israel of God's faithfulness even during times of trauma, difficulty and famine. So listen then as Helen reads to us the background to what turns out to be a good news story, a gospel story of even through stress and trauma. Helen. The book of Kings was written for the people of Israel who have been hauled off to exile in Babylon to remind them that their ancestors had indeed wandered far from the Lord and from his truth. But God had not abandoned them. And so here in 2 Kings chapter 6 verses 24 into chapter 7, we come across this account of the people of Israel under siege in their capital city of Samaria by Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, and that is from the region of the Golan Heights. And so we read this terrible and tragic story of starvation. Sometime later, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, mobilised his entire army to march up and lay siege to Samaria. There was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver and a quarter of a cap of seed pods for five shekels. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him, Help me, my lord the king. The king replied, If the lord does not help you, where can I get help for you? From the threshing floor? From the wine press? Then he asked her, what's the matter? She answered, this woman said to me, give up your son that we may eat him today and tomorrow we will eat my son. So we cooked my son and ate him. The next day I said to her, give up your son so that we may eat him. But she had hidden him. When the king heard the woman's words, he tore his robes. He went along the wall, the people looked, and they saw that under his robes he had sackcloth on his body. He said, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if the head of Elisha, son of Saphat, remains on his shoulders today. Now Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. The king sent a messenger ahead, but before he arrived, Elisha said to the elders, Don't you see how this murderer is sending someone to cut off my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold it shut against him. Is not the sound of his master's footsteps behind him? While he was still talking to them, the messenger came down to him. The king said, This disaster is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Elisha replied, Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, a seeth of the finest flour will sell for a shekel, and two seeths of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The officer on whose arm the king was leaning said to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, could this happen? You will see it with your own eyes, answered Elisha, but you will not eat any of it. 
2 Kings 6 and 7 is the terrible story of a city under siege. The wretched poor reduced to eating seed pods. It's a really shocking story. And Elisha, as God's messenger, gets the blame. It's interesting, isn't it, how God or his representatives often get the blame for the evil deeds of human beings. Human freedom and free will is good. It's okay until it's not. And so here too, the king of Israel, angry at the uh, circumstances, wants somebody to blame for the siege of a city. And he's determined to chop off the head of God's representative. Basically, he said, I'm fed up waiting for the Lord. I'm tired repenting. So let's read the rest of the story. But for a change, I'm going to read from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase from the message, 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 1. Elisha said, listen, God's word. The famine is over. This time tomorrow, food will be plentiful. A handful of meal for a shekel, two handfuls of grain for a shekel. The market at the city gate will be buzzing. The attendant upon whom the king leaned for support said to the holy man, You expect us to believe that? Trap doors open from heaven and food tumbling out? You will watch it with your own eyes, he said, but you will not eat so much as a mouthful. It happened that four lepers were sitting just outside the city gate. They said to one another, What are we doing sitting here at death's door? If we enter the famine-struck city, we'll die. If we stay here, we'll die. So let's take our chances by going to the camp of Aram and throw ourselves on their mercy. If they receive us, we live. If they kill us, we'll die. So we've nothing to lose. So after sun went down, they got up and went to the camp of Aram. When they got to the edge of the camp, surprise, not a man in the camp. The Lord had made the army of Aram hear the sound of horses and a mighty army on the march. They told one another, the king of Israel hired the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to attack us. Panicked, they ran for their lives through the darkness, abandoning tents, horses, donkeys, the whole camp, just as it was, running for dear life. These four lepers entered the camp and went into a tent. First they ate and drank. Then they grabbed silver and gold and clothing and went off and hid it. Then they came back, entered another tent, and looted it, again hiding their plunder. Finally, they said to one another, We shouldn't be doing this. This is a day of good news, a gospel day, and we are making it into a great private party. If we wait around until morning, we will get caught and punished. Come on, let's go and tell the news to the king's palace. So they went and called out at the city gate, telling what had happened. We went to the camp of Aram and surprise, the place was deserted. Not a soul, not a sound. Horses and donkeys left tethered and tents abandoned just as they were. The gatekeepers got the words to the royal palace, giving them the whole story. Roused in the middle of the night, the king told his servants, Let me tell you what Aram has done. They knew that we were starving, so they left camp and have hidden the fields, thinking, When they come out to the city, we'll capture them alive and take the city. One of his advisers answered, Let some men go and take five of the horses left behind. The worst that can happen is no worse than what could happen to the whole city. Let's send them and find out what has happened. So they took two chariots with horses, 
The king sent them after the army of Aram with the orders, scout them out and find what has happened. They went after them all the way to the Jordan. The whole way was strewn with clothes and equipment that Aram had dumped in their panicked flight. The scouts came back and reported to the king. The people then looted the camp of Aram. Food prices dropped overnight. A handful of meal for a shekel, two handfuls of grain for a shekel. God's word to the letter. The king ordered his attendant, the one he leaned on for support, to be in charge of the city gate. The people turned into a mob, poured through the gate, trampling him to death. It was exactly as the holy man had said when the king had come to see him. And we pray that God will give us understanding of these readings from his word. Let's just have a word of prayer. Our gracious God, who knows what we would think, what we would say, or how we would act in a desperate situation such as the one we've just read about. But please, as we consider this particular event from our place of relative comfort, will you grant us the wisdom and guidance of the Holy Spirit so that he would impress on our hearts gospel truth. For Jesus' sake. Amen. I use that word gospel truth for a very good reason. Because in chapter 7 verse 9 we read, This is the day of good news. In other words, it is a gospel day. So hopefully as we consider this story, It will be a gospel day for us as well. Because 2 Kings 7 isn't simply a story about starvation, siege and supply, but it is an account of supernatural, spiritual salvation. So here we find that the people of the northern kingdom in Israel were in a desperate situation. Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, that's the region of the Golan Heights and beyond, had laid siege in the capital city of Samaria, that's the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, and it was a long-term effective strategy. He had surrounded the city, cut off the supplies, and settled back to starve the people into submission, just as the siege of Derry or Limerick reduced its inhabitants to eating rats or worse. So the people here were in a desperate situation. Supplies became so scarce, the prices of things became so exorbitant, that soon the people were reduced to cannibalism. And instead of eating uh, uh, as they ought, the king was in utter despair. And from a point of repentance and faith, the situation led the king to blame the man of God for this trauma. And he vowed to take his anger out on the prophet Elisha. He dispatched his attendant to chop off Elisha's head. But Elisha wisely wouldn't let him come near, but instead informed the king through his representative that as Sure as God had spoken, by this time tomorrow, circumstances would be reversed. The famine would be over. We will love to hear the same news about COVID-19, won't we? That the panic of the pandemic will soon be over. Well, the unnamed attendant upon whom the king relied was scathing in his retort. You expect us to believe that? Trap doors opening from the sky, food tumbling out. The king's representative was sarcastic to the man of God. And in that, he was dismissive of the Lord's word. And so Elisha promised that while the attendant would see the famine coming to an end with his very own eyes, his lips would not benefit from even one little morsel. So then, 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 3 to 20, take us back to the besieged city. 
And here we are introduced to four men with leprosy. Leprosy was that deadly disease at that time. And what I'd like to do now, if I may, is to go back to the story, except this time I would like you as the hearers to view it with gospel eyes, to hear it as a good news missional story of Jesus and his love. And that way, not only to read it as an historical event, but an up-to-date gospel event. So here in 2 Kings 7, we meet these four leprous men, living, or rather barely surviving, at the city gate. Now, if conditions were bad within the city, and they were, the people reduced to eating a very unkosher donkey's head, and pigeon droppings. They were even worse for these poor, benighted creatures, excluded from society and suffering from an incurable and terminal condition that would lead to their inevitable death. And so, with impeccable logic, they said, if we stay here at the city gate, we're going to die. Nobody in the city is ever going to give us a crust of bread because they don't have any. And if we go into the city, they're going to turn on us because of our medical condition and probably kill us uh, with the infection that we have. Um, and so we might as well go to the camp of ben Hadda, the king of Aram, and surrender. If by any stretch of luck they treat us according to the Convention of Human Rights and make us prisoners of war, at least they might feed us. But if they kill us, we'll sure we're going to die anyway. In other words, they were in a situation of utter helplessness. But they said, we've nothing to lose. We can't rescue ourselves. What's the worst thing that can happen? Who can tell if God won't have mercy on us? And at least we will have exhausted every possible possibility. And so they got up, they went out of the camp, and they went to the Arameans. Well, when they reached the enemy camp, much to their surprise, they discovered that not a single soldier was there because the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army. They had imagined that the king of Israel had hired mercenaries uh, to attack them. And so they had got up, they had fled into the dark, had abandoned their tents and their horses and their donkeys. They had run for their lives. The same God who incidentally in chapter 6 had caused the then Syrian army to see things that weren't there, the Lord now caused this other Syrian army to hear things that weren't there. There's a certain sense of humour in this account. He who sits in the heavens laughs, we're told in Psalm 2. The Lord holds them in derision. And so amazingly, astonishingly, these four wretched lepers discovered unexpected and lavish grace, where previously they had only anticipated, at best, the improbable possibility of survival, or much, much worse. And now that the Syrians had gone, the lepers had this abundance of good things all to themselves. What a discovery! And so they ate and they drank and they carried away the plunder the army had stashed away in their tents, and they hid it. They stockpiled clothes and gold and silver until they were exhausted by God's unexpected and undeserved blessings upon blessings upon blessings. Having gorged themselves to the full and amassed a whole hoard of treasure, they sat back and took stock. Their consciences began to prick them. And they said to each other, Do you know something? What we're doing can't be right. This is a day for good news, verse 9. And we are keeping it to ourselves. You could put it this way. 
we have received the gospel, it is unbelievable. It is wonderful. We are aware of how much Jesus has loved us and what he has given to us to reconcile us to God on the cross. We are selfishly not telling other people about this reconciliation. And that can't be right. Here we are. We had nothing to hope for. We had nothing to live for. No hope in this life or for the life to come. And yet God has provided for us this most amazing and supernatural uh, wonder. We've enjoyed that provision. We have relished the good news but the gospel that God has loved the world and given his only son, we are keeping it to ourselves. And to gorge on that means we'll only get fatter and fatter while other people get thinner and thinner. And so they went on to surmise, if we succumb to selfishness, then let's not be surprised if God or the king or both probably uh, will refuse to uh, let us uh, enjoy the further supplies of life. They'll be angry with us. And uh, so we really ought uh, to share what we have with other people. And so verse 9, they determine to go at once and report this to the royal palace. Dying beggars became enthusiastic heralds. Certain death was transformed into abundant life. Desperate victims became grateful evangelists. And you know how good news uh, spreads, don't you? Verse 10. The lepers, they told the gatekeepers, and the gatekeepers shouted the news around the city, and the word rapidly spread and eventually got through to the royal palace, and the king was... Cynical, sceptical, suspicious. I know what has happened, he said. Don't fall for that cock and bull story. It's obviously far too good to be true. It's a trap. I know what has happened. The Arameans, they know we're starving. So they've left their camp, leaving it like a honey trap, so that when we, like stupid birds, flock to the bird table and start pecking at the seeds, whoosh, a great big net thrown overhead, and bam, we're trapped and dead. Don't believe a word of it. This gospel truth thing is too good to be true. We are far safer remaining here. Stay in our silos. Let's remain safe in our sin and misery and death. Sound familiar? And yet, providentially, and very courageously, one of his officers piped up and said, Your Majesty, At least let us send a reconnaissance. Let's ask a unit to go and investigate. And at least we'll be able to verify or disprove this good news account. And incredibly, wonderfully they did. And they discovered for themselves and for the city that what these four lepers had told them was true. And that very day, fresh supplies of food were made available to feed the starving masses and the ridiculous cost of food immediately plummeted, just as Alicia had said it would. And the people were wonderfully saved. A gospel story? A story of God's great love and compassion? Christ loves me? And gave himself for me, but not only for me, but for others as well. But there is a P.S. I wonder if you noticed it. Remember that unnamed attendant upon whom the king relied, that political spad, as it were. 
He had been scathing in his response to Elisha, the man of God. Do you suppose we can expect trap doors opening from heaven and food tumbling out? How preposterous. Well, in verse 17, we're told that the king put that very officer in charge of his gate. And as the people rushed to evacuate the city and breathe the fresh air and the freedom of outside, in their eagerness, the people trampled this benighted servant at the city gate. He died, thus fulfilling what Elisha had warned, that for his cynical, stubborn unbelief, while he would see the end of the famine, he would never taste the fruit with his lips. That's sobering, isn't it? There are some who, although they hear the gospel, scorn it, and so themselves perish and never personally benefit for its goodness. How tragic. But, but for those with ears to hear and hearts to respond, this is a gospel story. Hungry people who are fed, dying people who are raised to life, poor people who are unexpectedly and wonderfully granted glorious and abundant treasure through the sheer grace and mercy of a sovereign and loving and gracious Lord. Listen. At this specific moment in history, this particular time of our lives, please know, this is a good news day. It is a gospel day. We have the gospel of Jesus and his salvation. It is our privilege. It is our responsibility. It is our delight to share it. Shall we pray? O oh Lord, may now your church rise with power and love, this glorious gospel proclaim. In every nation, salvation will come to those who believe in your name. Help us bring light to this world that we may speed your return. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Pour out your Spirit, we pray. And what we ask is in the name and for the glory of our Saviour. Amen.
the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest, remain, and abide with you this day and forevermore. Amen.